Good morning, everyone. On Thursday, August 19th, 2021, this is Chuck King from Ford City, Pennsylvania, bringing you the morning Bible study, and we are studying the subject, Examine Yourselves. And we're ready to look at James 4, 4 to 10. But just before we do that, I want to talk about Revelation chapter 21, where John the Apostle was shown a huge and beautiful city coming down from heaven. And the angel identifies this city as the bride of Christ, which would be the body of Christ with the church. And the description is amazing. It's a huge city, so large with high and thick walls, 12 gates and 12 foundations. And without going into detail, we know that we have both the, the righteous Jewish people from all ages, or all centuries rather, represented here along with all the godly New Testament believers. We have 12 gates of huge pearls which represent the uh, children of Israel, the, the 12 tribes, and we have 12 foundations of beautiful precious stones representing the 12 apostles. The streets are gold. And uh, what we can conclude from this is this is the metaphor or the symbol of the body of Christ, which will be pure and without spot or wrinkle according to Scripture. And please notice that there is no wood, hay, or straw in the city, only that which is gold and silver and precious stones is described in the, the city that comes down from heaven, the bride of Christ. So we need to understand that, that eternally our rewards are based upon the gold, the silver, and precious stones. That response to the Lord, which is obedience doing the will of the Father. Nothing else will remain. It will all be burned up. And here in the scripture today, this is the final scripture of this teaching. In James 4, 4 to 10, let's read, You adulteresses. Why would he call them adulteresses? This is not the uh, man of God speaking to unbelievers, but this is the man of God James speaking to disciples, and he calls them adulteresses. Why would he do that? A spiritual adulterer is someone who becomes a friend of the world and therefore becomes hostile toward God. That's what he says here. Do you not know that friendship with the world, meaning the world's system, the way of the world, the world's wisdom, identifying and copying the ways of the world. This is why Romans 12 says, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, Romans 12, 1 and 2, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is. We should want the will of God. We cannot find the will of God by being friends of the world system, which is Antichrist. We find ourselves in opposition toward God when we become a friend of the world. This is why James calls them adulteresses, because they have become friends of the world. They've replaced their first love, passion, and commitment as the bride of Christ to the Lord by friendship with the world. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Can it be any clearer than that? You can't have it both ways. 
You can't love the world and love God at the same time. That's why John tells us, love not the world, nor the things in the world. If we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. We must have this commitment, priority, number one passion as love for God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? And then there's a quote here. He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. So our God is a jealous God for his people. He doesn't want to share us with the world. He wants the spirit of God to dwell in us and guide our steps that we might be empowered not by the world or its wisdom, but by the Holy Spirit. Let's continue. But he gives a greater grace. So what does the Lord give us to overcome the world? Grace. And if we need more grace, he gives us even greater grace that we might walk in the Spirit and not in the ways of the world. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, who can receive the supernatural supply of power except the humble? No one. When you humble yourself before the Lord, you lower yourself before him and admit who you are and who he is. You admit that you are broken and in need of grace. You are uh, in need of mercy. And and you are a needy person and need a, a transformation by his power. You admit who you are, that you without him you cannot overcome the world. But with him you can do everything. Because he's glorious and mighty and powerful and kind to those who seek him. Pride is the opposite of that. Pride insists that we can do it on our own, that we have the ability, the strength to be righteous people without his power. And God opposes everyone who manifests that pride. Pride is the original sin of both angels and men. This is why people fall and turn away and follow the world and become friends of the world instead of a friend of God because they don't believe what God reveals to us. And God reveals to us that pride in us is destructive. We must turn away from it through humility, admitting that we are nothing and that we need him every moment. Submit, therefore, to God. We have to yield ourselves. We have to voluntarily lay down our rights in order to submit to him. We must choose to do that. We must lay down our free will as servants, as bond servants of God. And then if we, if we come in humility and submission before the Lord, we receive the grace we need to be the friend of God. And we can resist the devil and he will flee from you. How can you resist the devil in the pride of your flesh? You can't. We can't overcome the devil except by the armor of God. The armor of God is putting on Jesus Christ. It's putting the grace of God uh, around ourselves to overcome We can't overcome the devil in our own natural power. We have no power naturally to resist the devil and make him flee from us. We need the grace of God, the power of God. Draw near to God 
and he will draw near to you. Do you see that? That's a standard throughout the entire Bible, Old and New Testament. When you seek him, you will find him if you search for him with all of your heart. We have to draw near to him. We have to seek him. And then he will respond. Drawing near to God is a response of faith. It shows that we believe that we would seek him diligently. And this is the problem with the church today. We are not, as a church, crying out and seeking after the only one who can save us. Where are the, the corporate prayer meetings crying out to God for the, for the situations we are in? in this generation? Where are the people? Where are they crying out and seeking diligently and hungering and thirsting for him? If we begin to do that, we will find him. He will draw near to us if we draw near to him. Look what it says. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. He's speaking to disciples here. We've got to deal with sin within the church, among us. We've got to get rid of it and purify your hearts, you double-minded. We've got to get rid of sin and double-mindedness. Double-minded means that we are hanging on to doubt and fear as well as faith, and we can't be successful that way. We are, as James tells us, like someone tossed about on the ways of the sea, unstable in all of our ways. We have to get rid of sin and double-mindedness in the church. And our attitude ought to be, as described here, be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. We're not to be these people that always need to be happy and full of of joy. But when, when we have the need to seek the Lord, to get rid of sin and double-mindedness, to, to get rid of this love of the world, this friendship with the world, this, this uh, worldliness that offends God, that causes him to be grieved when that situation exists. And I believe it does in the church today. We need to be miserable and mourn and weep and let our joy be turned into gloom, our laughter in the morning and in humility in the presence of the Lord. We need to seek him and then he will Give us the grace we need to overcome. So humility is the key to receiving grace. You see described here disciples who are examining themselves, looking at their behavior and seeing that it is worldly, that it offends God, that God wants us to repent and humble ourselves, and so we do. And we don't, we don't do so lightly, but we do so diligently and with great effort. We get rid of sin and double-mindedness and actually in an attitude of mourning and weeping and gloom, we humble ourselves before him. He is the only one that can change us and give us the grace we need. My friends, if you look around, the situations are desperate. We have the world following the spirit of Antichrist. We have the church in disarray. We have dear brothers and sisters suffering horribly in persecution in many nations. We, we have others among us who are weak and sick. Some have died because 
of the church's weakness and worldliness and double-mindedness. Let us examine ourselves and repent. Let's come before him and seek him for his solution that the will of the Father might be done and that his name would be glorified. Let's become the pure and spotless bride that the Bible describes the church should be. God bless you. Share this message, please. And we will be sharing again with you tomorrow. God bless.